All right, guys, today we're going to be taking care of some odds and ends on the 98 Jeep Cherokee XJ LS swap that we're in the middle of. My name's LT, and I build custom, high-performance, and off-road trucks. So if any of those things appeal to you, definitely you want to subscribe to this channel because we're trying to reach 100,000 subs by the end of 2021, and we're almost halfway there. So I know we can make it happen, although I do need your help. Also, if you want me to work on your vehicle, drop an email to tolmanperformance at gmail.com because I also do customer builds as well, just like this one right here. So, 98 Cherokee XJ. Under the hood, I have been tasked with installing a 6-liter LQ4. It's got an LS6 car intake on there. It's a pretty cool Jeep. It's on a long arm kit, Dana 60s front and rear, full chassis reinforcement, and obviously the big V8 under the hood. So, what are we going to take care of today? Uh, on the last upload, I showed you building the front half of the exhaust. It was a mandrel bent stainless steel TIG welded two and a half into single three inch exhaust. And we got plenty of clearance for all the moving parts under this vehicle because you know, on an off-road thing like this, everything's going to be articulating and twisting and moving around quite a bit more than it would be on a street vehicle. So we accounted for all that and we've got great uh, ground clearance. In fact, you can't even see the exhaust sticking down below the level of the frame rail. So, uh, before I permanently install the front half of the exhaust, though it's just kind of bolted in right now, I do want to take care of the trans cooler lines just because it's going to be a pain in the butt to reach up in there and install those fittings onto the side of the 4L60 with the Y pipe installed. So we'll just knock that out today before we get the exhaust permanently installed. And next time in the next upload, I'll show you building the back half of the exhaust. But there's also a couple of quick things I just wanted to share with you since uploading this Jeep video two videos ago. Now, one of the big challenges that I outlined in that video was the best way to get an air intake into the engine because clearance is so tight around here. So there were two options that I had kind of outlined. One, filter directly on the throttle body, which I hate that idea. And number two, a three inch tube going here between the alternator and the core support because that is the tightest spot of this whole project. I didn't want to go that way because number one, the AC pump and number two, the upper radiator hose is going to go there. Now this is three and a half inch pipe and this is kind of what I would consider to be the bare minimum size for an intake tube on an engine like this. Yes, three inch would work, but it's not ideal. Um, you guys also did offer some great solutions down below in the comments and there were two major groups that you guys, a lot of you guys did come up with, so thank you for that. Um, either one run a split intake system, so there's like a Y pipe and there's maybe two smaller pipes going off to each side, which would work also some sort of an oval tube. Now I could take some of this aluminum and just squish it in the vise to make my own oval. Don't love that idea. Or you can buy pre-made aluminum tubing, but that stuff is a little bit expensive. Also, there's a very obvious solution that I totally overlooked. Now, I was going down the path of like, we're gonna have to put a different accessory drive on here to move the alternator, but that's a pain in the butt. And the owner already did, you know, purchase the accessory drive on here. It is a nice accessory drive, um, but I didn't wanna to have to redo that either. So, I feel really dumb for not even realizing this, but the obvious solution is just to trim the upper core support mount right here, kind of where I have this dotted line. This will allow me more than enough room to get that three and a half inch pipe in between the alternator and this rest of the core support. And there's nothing under here. The radiator is about at this level right here all the way back. So there's zero reason why I can't just chop that thing off. I'll come in and weld another piece of sheet metal down at an angle because that's kind of what's back there now, this little lip. So that'll look sort of continuous when I'm done with it. It'll be just as strong as it was before. Not that it even really needs that reinforcement, but I'll easily be able to run that three and a half inch intake tube with no problems at all. So just one of those things where you're like staring at the problem forever and then the obvious solution is right in front of you. You just haven't seen it. Also, there's one more thing that I kind of wanted to address on these motor mounts. Uh, it's a simple fix, not a huge deal, a little bit annoying, but that's okay. It would be a very simple thing to take care of. Um, the motor mounts for this conversion are basically uh, two urethane isolators, an upper and a lower, with a carriage bolt that goes through the middle, a nut and a washer on the bottom. Now the nut that they provided was the 5.8s, one of those prevailing torque nuts, I think they call it. That's perfect because you don't want to completely clamp down on the isolator because there's no steel bushing through the middle of it. Uh, but then the washer that they gave with the kit is like a little bit less than an inch in outside diameter. And then the, the flat spot on the top of the bushing or the bottom of the bushing is about two inches in diameter. So when that motor is kind of torquing back and forth, it could easily pull that small washer kind of 
into the urethane, which is not a good thing. I didn't want that to happen. So I went on Amazon and I picked up a couple of, they're called fender washers, but they're much bigger than anything you'd actually put on a fender. Uh, but this is kind of what they look like when I got done with them. So it's a 5 8 fender washer. It has a two inch outside diameter that'll perfectly match the urethane. And then because they were pretty thin, I just TIG welded two of them together. These are stainless steel. Uh, so I got a pair of them made up, boom. Simple swap, we'll take care of that first. So a lot of the stuff that I'm doing underneath on the transmission is really hard to show you guys simply because of how little space there is in between the floorboard, the trans tunnel, and then the transmission itself. I'm basically just having to get my hands up in there and just feel around. Not a huge deal. There's plenty of space for the hoses to go, but just to get a camera and a good line of sight, not going to happen right now. So I'll just give you a quick update of where we're at. I started out by installing the fittings into the side of the transmission. This is the part number that we're using. We're just adapting from that straight thread with the brass seal to a dash 6AN. Now, if you're doing this on a 4L80, pay attention, because the rear fitting of the cooler on a 4L80, and I think it's the later model ones from like 96, 97 and newer, not positive on that, but I do know most 4L80s that you're gonna be seeing uh, I think the ones with a cooler return port on the far back. You will burn them up if you run this exact part number of fitting in the case. Now the reason for that is because there's a special extended fitting that goes on the rear only and that's to provide lubrication to the rear drum, I think. And if you don't have that special fitting, it will burn up due to lack of lubrication. Anyway, this is a 4L60 and that does not apply, but just keep that in mind if you are swapping in a 4L80. As far as the rest of the parts go, we're running this AN line kit. It's from Amazon, I believe. Here's the part number, and I will put links in the description for all this stuff below. This particular kit comes with this roll of hose. No idea how long it is. It's probably 25 feet or so. Has two of everything, two 90s, two 180s, two straights, and two 45s. For some reason unknown to me, they also include these little itty bitty O-rings and they were actually stuck down inside the end of the fitting there, which is a little bit concerning because if you know anything about plumbing with AN fittings, you know it's a flare style of fitting. It's a 37 degree flare and there is no O-ring required to make a proper seal. So I have no idea why there are AN or O-ring fittings in there because I've used all the name brand of AN fittings, you know, and there's never ever been an O-ring in an AN style hose end. So no idea what's going on there. We're not gonna be running a O-ring because that's not how the fitting is designed to work. So if you run across that, just kind of keep in mind how these fittings are supposed to work. Anyway, this hose is nice because it has this cloth braided outside. And if you look on the end where it's cut, it does appear to have a single layer of steel reinforcement. So hopefully this hose will hold up to what we're asking of it. There's not necessarily a ton of pressure going through a transmission cooler line. Um, but obviously if you're using something like power steering, something with a lot of high pressure, you may want to be careful about what hoses that you select. Anyway, for this application, I think this hose kit will be just fine. No worries there. Uh, next thing I had to do is I had to modify the transmission dipstick that was provided. I think it was a Hughes part. Here it is here, just kind of drying. And all I really had to do was move or make a new mount tab that this one now bolts to the back of the cylinder head because this had one tab right here. And on the back of the LS engines on the bell housing, there's, you know, a couple of bolts there and there's one that is not tapped and I think it's because of the cam sensor or something like that but this dipstick was for like a small block Chevy that had that hole tapped into it so not a huge deal just another little thing that you have to account for whenever you're building vehicles a lot of times parts are gonna have to be tweaked or modified and sometimes it's quicker than you know sending it back and waiting for another one to show up because you know this dipstick it fit perfectly in the spot in the Jeep where it needed to go it came up right here kind of in the back so it fit perfectly. I didn't want to risk getting another one with a different shape that would have bolted up to the bell housing but might not have fit. So 
Anyway, uh, simple modification. It also was that gold color, but now I spray painted it that satin black so it'll match the other dipstick and it matches the theme going on underneath the hood. So let's get back to work. Working with these AN hose ends is pretty straightforward. First thing that you're gonna to wanna to do, take the hose end apart and put the nut on the hose. This particular style more or less just kind of pushes off. I basically go in until the hose is all the way up just under the threaded bar. Probably can't see that, but more or less push it until it stops. Always a good idea to put some sort of a lubricant on these. I like to use gear oil, but WD-40, anything that's slippery will pretty much work. This part right here actually goes inside the rubber hose. Also important, you do not want to turn the nut on the hose, you want to turn the fitting into the nut. Now it's on. This is a swivel fitting, which means the end of the hose can actually swivel 360 degrees independent from the hose in the fitting. Makes for lighting up things a lot easier. So the trans cooler lines are built, they're sort of run where they're gonna be. It's not permanent, but I'm just gonna wait until I get the rest of the cooling system done up front because we still have to mount the AC condenser. Uh, the trans cooler will mount to the front of that. And then whenever I get all that stuff mounted and the wiring and plumbing a little bit more finalized, I'll just add some ends on those hoses and attach them to the trans cooler that the customer provided. So that'll happen in just a little bit. Uh, one thing I did notice in the instructions on Amazon for those uh, AN hoses that I have here, they actually, in the instructions, say you're supposed to hold the uh, hose fitting stationary and turn the nut that's on the hose to tighten it up. That's a little bit different from anything I've ever read, but I guess if you want to follow the instructions to the letter of the law, that's exactly what they want you to do. That's not what I did, but 
that's all right. So now we're going to move on to the one last thing I need to do before I can finally put the exhaust permanently back underneath the truck. And I just need to add a V-band flange and make a slight extension onto the end of the wide pipe. Now where this sits right now is directly on top of the cross member. So if I put a V-band right here, it's not a huge deal. It'll just be a little bit difficult to get the clamp apart. So I'm just going to add this small four inch long extension right here to clear the cross member. So the V-band flange should be directly behind the cross member very easy to get to and then on the other end of the v-band flange we're going to add the catalytic converter and then next time i can easily build from this joint all the way back to the tailpipe so a couple of quick welds throw the exhaust back under the truck and today we are done The last piece of advice that I'm going to leave with you for this upload, whenever you're working with a V-band flange, always clamp them together when you're welding. I love V-bands. I put them on just about every exhaust system that I do. They're quick and easy to disconnect and they usually don't leak just as long as you don't warp them while you're welding. Now, admittedly, it does take quite a bit of heat to warp a good V-band flange, but just to prevent that from happening, I always clamp it together with its mate. Number one, that kind of acts like a bit of a heat soak. And number two, it just helps keep everything flat. And I always leave them clamped together until the metal cools down all the way till you can touch it. And in my experience, that's been the best way to weld v-bands so the front half of the exhaust is now 100 percent complete ready to go up underneath the jeep for the very last time and then all i need to do is connect that right there the cat to the muffler to the tailpipe and the exhaust is done now i will say this one thing the way that I build exhaust is definitely not quick. It's definitely not a cheap and easy way to go. You could definitely take any engine swap project that you've got going, take it to a muffler shop, and for a couple hundred bucks maybe, they could slap together a system. But usually, nothing against muffler shops, but usually most muffler and exhaust shops just have a tubing bender that kind of crushes the tube. And that'll get the job done. The exhaust will certainly flow from the header all the way to the tailpipe. But if you want the absolute best performing and looking system, nothing beats mandrel bends and TIG wells. Although the trade-off definitely is the amount of time that it takes to get the job done. But that being said, the exhaust is pretty much, I'd say three quarters of the way done because the back half is gonna go fairly simply. And from there, we're almost ready to get this Jeep fired up. Really, we've got a couple of plumbing things to knock out and a couple of electrical things. So once we get the fuel lines in, uh, the trans cooler lines finished up, oil in it, you know, uh, fluid in the transmission, fluid in the transfer case, haven't done that yet. Uh, a couple of wiring things. We can fire this thing up for the first time. So we're getting there. It's definitely gonna be a process. There's definitely a lot of there's a lot of little things and you know each of those little things collectively don't take a whole lot of time but when you add them up actually that's the opposite of what collectively means but anyway the individual parts don't take a whole lot collectively it does add up in time that's how i should have said it but anyway 
thank you guys for watching. I do appreciate you. If you haven't already, subscribe to this channel. If you like Jeeps, if you like trucks, if you like turbos, if you like burnouts, I still owe you guys a burnout video for the 8.1 truck. But anyway, subscribe to the channel. Turn that notification bell on. Um, that's supposed to help, I guess. Click like on this video. Drop a comment down below. Visit tolmanperformance.com to grab a hat or a hoodie. Whew, that's a long list. You guys are the best. Thanks for watching. We'll see you later.